All right, so a couple of in-course things. At this point, you should have finished the introduction discussion board, right? I'm going to be grading those very shortly. Um, so be keeping an eye out for your grade, and if you lost points, checking why or looking at the comments. Um, hopefully that's not the case for anybody. Uh, and if we're, huh? The introduction was assigned the first day. If you haven't done it, do it now so that you don't lose points. <laughs> okay. All right. So somewhat, a couple of people must not have done it because I only have 21 to grade, and I think there are 25 in this class. So if you're one of the few, get it done before I get around to grading it this week. So um, speaking of which, I might as well just go to my student view. That's why I keep this home page for you guys, because if you're a student and you haven't done something, it kind of helps you because it'll it'll be there, right? Over here to do, right? I didn't do it. I could lose 10 points. It was already due, so I better hurry up and do it before Miss Burns grades it, because the computer doesn't grade it. I grade it, so you have you still have a little bit of time, right? So take advantage of that. Uh, so let's see, what does it say for grades though? Why do I have a grade? Why do I have a one? What did I click on? Oh, the Wiley for some reason. It did register when I did that last time, All right? But I only answered one question apparently, so I only got one point out of the 14. Um, but this should update. I know I had a problem with my online class. If for some reason you've done the assignment in Wiley, it says you have 14 out of 14, and for some reason it doesn't in Canvas, shoot me an email. I might have to have the Wiley people do a, what's called a sync. Okay, they had to do that for my online class. Things weren't syncing up. So um, I'll try to do a couple of checks. But sometimes with something like that, if you guys shoot me a quick email, it'll help me out too if your grades aren't syncing. So yeah, so far, so far just introduction, which I don't have a score. But you'll have a score. You'll have other little boxes that will show up after I grade it, right? Um, and... So remember, everything's under modules, all the important stuff. So I, as promised, I added the need help page where I could post the public service announcements. So the most, the most recent email that they sent out to everybody, including faculty, was if anybody's <laughs> graduating, to let you know that the deadline to apply through Lola, by the way, which I did not write that, is Friday, February 24th, and today's the last day of January, so this is coming up, right? So make sure if you're planning to graduate that you do that. I put, you know, lots of information, campus map, the computer lab upstairs, hours, the library link to their home page, about your new student ID, which you need if you want to use the library in the open lab, single stop, which is just down the hall, and of course the awesome Science Resource Center. Their hours and information. And so as they send stuff, or if you guys um, have something you think your other classmates would benefit from knowing, let me know and I can add it to the page and I can announce it in class. Um, so back to modules. The other thing I added was uh, how best to do these assignments. And then one of your classmates, of course, asked me a question after I hit the end of the recording and you guys were all leaving. <laughs> so I stayed and added it to the end of the recording. Um, and that is... you. When you do these assignments, like I said, it should update in Canvas, and only your highest grade will be kept in Canvas for these assignments, right? So do them as I suggested, right? If you're getting a whole bunch wrong, just close out of it, go back. It wasn't me. I'm pretty sure my phone's off from lab. Okay. Uh, <laughs> good thing I'm not going to give pop quizzes. Okay. So um, the other thing I've done is I got all the stuff posted for this first module now. Um, this is also a wiki page that I use to organize all this information for you guys. So you'll notice um, I added um, some recommendations as I'm going through the book and re-watching this stuff and I'm like really what is worth my students time and what isn't, right? Um, so I'm putting these recommendations like so for instance in the book like if you're not a big reader by the way which I don't think this book has this um, ability, but um, I'll show you guys a trick in a moment uh, about reading that I learned in grad school, which was awesome. Oh uh, 
So those of you guys that don't like to read it might help you. But also, <laughs> like, these animations, so notice I said this is a good summary of that section. So, you know, if you want to just get a quick summary, a visual thing, you, you're tired of reading that day, right, but you're like, you want to come prepared to this class, then you watch that, right? It's five minutes. You can usually handle that. Um, this one is good if you didn't watch the one I said to watch here, right? So if you didn't watch the one animation here, then go ahead and maybe when you, if you have your book open, click on the staining bacteria one. It's actually the gram stain. Um, and this peptidoglycan one is good, but it just focuses mainly on gram-positive cells, something we're going to start talking about today. So there's lots of great resources, and then the kind of outside of your book resources I put on this wiki page called Animations, Videos, and Links for Module 1. And so there, this was the gram stain one that I wanted you guys to watch before class. This is the one I'm actually going to use in class today, so I'm actually going to open that in a new tab. These are other ones um, that are by a different book publisher. And I think a couple of these were posted by that publisher itself, so they won't be taken down. Others, other people posted, I didn't realize, and they got taken down. <laughs> so I had to change my list because it's copyrighted material, right? So if the people who have the copyright aren't the ones who post it and someone else does, eventually they get found out and they get it taken off. YouTube. That's how that works. Right? Um, so, remember that um, page on size and scale that I wasn't happy with that they had kind of blocked out this um, scale? So I just copied <laughs> and pasted it from this page and I put it here so we could actually see these things. Because we're going to talk about this a little bit today. So, you know, most of us are familiar with meters, centimeters, millimeters, right? We can see that on uh, a ruler micrometers, or what sometimes is referred to as micrometers, um, is much smaller, right? It's a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. So this is microscopic measurements, right? And even nanometers, which is a billion times smaller than a meter, or a thousand times smaller than uh, <coughs> a micrometer. And then you can even get into angstroms and pinkometers, and this is with those really high-powered microscopes um, that we'll talk about. So the other thing you'll notice, and I guess I should have opened it. In a new tab, so I could go back and forth. So the beginning of the stuff that we're going to talk about is actually in your Appendix B of your book, right? Um, and then also the toolbox in Chapter 2, 1, which is referred to in, in Appendix B. And then Sections 2.4 is what um, the microscopy lecture really um, focuses in on for in your book. And then, as I said, within Chapter 2, these are the animations. So I wanted to show you guys, because we haven't really jumped around too much in your book, I wanted to show you how on the ebook, which everybody should have access to at this point, some of you guys have had to pay for this. Remember, if you're having trouble getting that page to load, caches and cookies. Clear your caches and cookies, and you should be good to go. If not, then call tech support. So, um, I'm going to open yet again another tab, just so that I can have everything open. The only problem that the students run into sometimes, too, is you can't have the book open and try to do Wiley assignments. You can only have one Wiley plus thing open on your computer at a time. So those of you guys taking anatomy and physiology too at the same time as this class, which you're crazy, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> you're using Wiley Plus for that too, right? You can't have your anatomy book or any of your anatomy assignments open and then try to open microbiology. It won't open. And that's why, right? You can only have one open at a time. I don't know exactly why it's like that, but you can't. You almost can't open multiple chapters of the same ebook. Because right. Even if it says a reference page, whatever, you have to yeah. you And that's what I'm going to show you. Okay. So, in preparing yesterday for today's lecture, guess what I was doing? Which you've been, been doing? <laughs> Watching animations, reading the book, 
right? And I didn't have my book. I was here. So I went upstairs in the computer lab and I clicked on this, right? And I went right here to the contents and I scroll down to the bottom to get to the, I unclicked my recording, right? The appendices are way down here. I got to not hit my pause button and you click on it and you'll see my cross B is B, as I said. So as you start reading, right, sometimes they'll say, I thought it was earlier. <coughs> oh, for instance, refer to this figure. See how it's highlighted in blue? Guess what happens when I click on it? If my pop-up blocker isn't on, it pops up. Bam! And it goes to it. So you can look at it. And then I can close it out. And the toolbox right here, you can click on it. The problem is, is that when you click on a window like this, and then I was like, oh, I want to watch this animation, <laughs> it wouldn't go. <laughs> right? You can't, like, a window to a window, unfortunately. That's kind of a glitch that they have, I guess. Um, but so this is the toolbox on, toolbox on gram staining, but the 2 stands for Chapter 2. So this is in Chapter 2. So you just go to chapter two, and the nice thing is for within the chapters, right? So here's the contents that goes through the chapter. You can click on the different sections here, but also down here, it has all the animations clumped together, right? So here's the animations, right, throughout the book. So you could just easily click on the staining bacteria one or the heptinoglycan one, which are two that I recommended. Make sense? So, you know, it just takes some practice in navigating, right, and looking at these things. Um, so the other thing is, is that I didn't realize, like, the pictures in the Appendix B are actually from throughout our book until I read it again, and I was like, <laughs> as an instructor, they provide us with you know, the pictures from the book, and we can put in our PowerPoints, and they also have PowerPoints that we can then change and whatnot. <laughs> they didn't have one for the appendices. So I was like, oh, how am I going to get those pictures? So I have old pictures from another book, but you know what? I think it's good, though, to give you guys some contrast in the different ways things can be, um, give you more examples instead of just your book. So, uh, but eventually I might add in, I know in the later ones I added in the book ones. But this one, I couldn't figure out how to do it at first until I was reading. I was like, oh, no, when did that picture look familiar? Because I've already seen it somewhere else in the book. <laughs> they just repeated it in the appendices. Uh, any questions on this? Right, so everybody has access to this, so you know if you're anywhere studying. But the thing is, you can't have this open and be working on your assignments. But remember, too, that when you're working on the assignment, you can, after you answer the question the first time, I usually give you links to the textbook right, where it'll pop up in a window and you can read through and look, right, so they are linked, and that's a nice thing, and I know it costs a little bit more money, but that way you guys have the resource you need right when you're doing things all the time, and you don't ever have to worry about not having it. Questions, problems, concerns? Um, okay. Does each assignment have a deadline each week, or is does it end that for the semester? Right. Okay. Which one? I'm going to explain it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, what I do for the Wiley Plus assignments, right, is remember I deploy them in the modules. And we only had one so far because we've only finished one topic, right? And that was microbiology. So, that's already here in the module. And it says Wiley even. So, you know that you're going to this other site. Um, I put a deadline on it in Canvas to help gauge, to help you guys gauge on when you should have this done by at the absolute latest possible date, right? When should you actually do this assignment? As soon as you think you know the information. If you've studied over the weekend, right, and you think you know it, hey, after class, go up to the computer lab. See if you can do it with your book closed because you don't even have it with you and you can't <laughs> open another link anyways, right? See how much you know. If you start getting them all right, woo, that's awesome, right? You start getting them all wrong, what do you do? You close out and you go back to studying and you come back to it later, right? 
But I put the deadlines, and I actually don't even put them in Wiley because I don't want to have to put it in two places. I just put them in Canvas. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So sometime very soon you should do microbiology, right? If you want to stay on track and not be one of those students like, I studied the night before the test. I don't understand why I failed. Don't be that person, right? Okay. So um, the PowerPoint. So our next, to next topic is microscopy. And because this is kind of a short one and it kind of <laughs> jumps around the book, I actually don't have a Wiley for this. But what have we been doing? What have we been doing that's helping you guys right now? We're polling every day. And look, practice quizzes from in-class polling. You don't actually get these points, right, because you already got them by being in class and participating. But if you have excessive absences, I'll look at this and maybe adjust your points accordingly, right? So just do them, right? They're going to benefit you potentially somehow, some way, right? Maybe not directly. You can do them as many times as you want. And I actually made the diseases one into um, a matching one. Because what did I say they probably would be on the test? Matching. This is not the one that's on the test, though. So I've been working ahead. So guess what? The one we did today? So that I don't forget. already done and now it's posted and I'm going to try to be that good from now on we'll see how long that lasts I'm hopeful I'm hopeful I think this is helping do you guys think it's helping <coughs> the asking the questions at the beginning class from last class I think so we'll find out yeah <laughs> okay hopefully it's encouraging you guys to study now right Oh, that's that's the goal and and to know if your studying is effective right so if you're getting these wrong right you're and you actually studied then you may need to rethink your study strategy right okay so our next topic is microscopy which is of course very important to microbiology because mostly we're studying things that you need a microscope to see right or other techniques so as it applies to microscopes how or why would you use, say, an electron microscope as opposed to the light microscopes we have here at Delgado? It depends on the uh, amount of magnification. Right, so the amount of magnification difference between those different types of microscopes. So um, depending on what you want to what? What you want to see, right? So if you are doing work on viruses, you're going to pick an electron microscope as opposed to a light microscope because you, they're too small, right, for a light microscope. You need an electron microscope in that case. So you're not going to write a grant to get money for a light microscope because that would be pretty, would be counterproductive, right? You'd be writing a big grant to get you an electron microscope, right? Especially if you want to study the structure, right? of that particular virus you're studying. So you're going to pick microscopes based on what questions you're asking, right? What do I want to see? What do I need to be able to see? How do I need to see it? In what detail do I need to see it? So as it applies to microscopes, there are important concepts that you have to take into consideration other than just magnification. And that's what we're going to define and talk about here. You still have a question, Dan? A, uh, electron microscope? I I couldn't even give you a ballpark figure right now. I'd have to Google it. Not a couple thousand dollars. More than that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know because you know, yeah, Google it. Google it. I don't want to be wrong. 20,000. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I mean, it just really depends on all the tricks. I mean, you could go, it could be a big range. It could be a big range. So just to give you guys an idea, when I was at LSU um, vet school working there in research, uh, that had one of these microscopes, um, it's a laser microscope, it's called confocal. It can take, um, uses a laser to take multiple images, um, basically kind of slicing through 
the specimen. And it has, of course, you're not actually seeing what it's seeing, the lasers generating a computer <coughs> image. But because of the laser and because it gets so hot, this, this particular microscope was within a room within a room. So, I mean, not unless somebody took you there, would you probably even find it? It's like worse than cubicle land. <laughs> Here at Delgado, right? <laughs> um, it had its own air conditioner. It was a great room to be in, right? Um, and I only got to observe my boss use it. I never actually got trained to use it. Um, so, but I got to see it in action. It was pretty cool stuff. So, when we're working with different microscopes, um, some can create contrasts. Um, our microscopes, for the most part, we have to stain our stuff to create contrast. Um, so contrast can be important to be able to distinguish your organism from its background, right? You need that contrast. Magnification, as we know, is important, right? There is a limitation to light microscopes. You can only go so small, right? And that's because you're working with light, where you can go much higher with electron microscopes and then even higher with atomic force microscopes. Resolution is important. You want to be actually able to resolve and see and distinguish the objects in which you're viewing under the microscope. Especially for light microscopes, the ability of those lenses become important. And that's where numerical aperture comes and factors in. That is basically the lens's prescription. It's how well it focuses light for that particular lens. Now glass lenses are fixed, right? You can't change them. So all our, my life class wearers in the class understand what I mean, right? You have a prescription, you have a number for your lenses to correct for your natural lenses in your eyes, which cannot um, adjust for you to be able to see distance or up close, or some of us older people, both is a problem, <laughs> right? Far and away is a problem. And then light, too, um, can be refracted. And so the refracted indices of the different substances we're working with um, can be something that we have to take into consideration. So let's look at each one of these separately. Magnification, most of us have a pretty good understanding of this, right? We're not actually, like, this is not, I'm trying to think of that, honey, I shrunk the kids. This is not honey, I shrunk the kids, right? This is not, <laughs> we're not beaming something at it and we're not blowing it up, right? In his case, he was shrinking things down, okay? Um, you're not actually physically making the object bigger. You're making the image of it appear larger than it actually is. Right? Most of us understand that, right? how magnification works. Um, so this can be done with lenses, <laughs> with uh, light microscopes. This can be done um, creating computer images based on the traveling of electrons with electron microscopes. Or this can be done um, with atomic force, with um, the atomic force microscopes, which falls into the category that they have here of scanning, scanning tunneling microscope, right? Um, where you can literally get down to the at atomic level, right? Where we're looking at single atoms. It's pretty crazy stuff. Um, but again, you're not physically looking at it. The computer is generating an image based on the da <laughs> data that it's acquiring from these forces that are exist in what you're looking at. You're looking at it, but not really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, uh, well, we still have the ability to, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that same website we went to before, so I'm not going to go to it again. And again, I, I, I clepto that scale, too, so you know, understand these measurements here. Um, so these are in angstroms, which is something that I never dealt in. You know, I was kind of in this world. <laughs> But not so scary. So the other thing with um, the images that you get from something like an electron microscope, um, they tend to be black and white, just like back in the day when we used to take pictures, they were black and white. Um, if there's color to it, somebody's physically gone in and colored the image, either by hand or computer-aided. Um, so just like they used to do that to old black and white photos, right? They used to color them. We do that with um, the images from electron microscopes so that people can, um, we can highlight different things we want people to see, right? Not that the things actually have that color to them. Does that make sense? Right. So um, I had an example of something and it just, okay. So, um, and, and so you're really looking at different shades of light and dark. 
And so here is actually a virus, uh, a bacterial phage. This is something that would infect a bacteria. It looks like a little spaceship, huh? Right, you get the head, you've got the tail, the tail fibers, the shaft here. I guess I didn't see that despicable me, but okay, I can't remember. Um, I blocked it out. Just kidding. <laughs> I do. I actually bought for myself Pete's Dragon. We actually cried watching that. My son cried watching Pete's Dragon. It's a good movie. But do you see this bar right here? So just like maps have um, scales on them. Usually these type of images too will have a scale bar on them. So this lets you know that like the length of this is 100 nanometers, right? So if we were to compare this, right, to the different parts, we could measure um, how big this object is. And you can do that with light microscopes too. You can actually use a, a micrometer. Um, they have little tiny rulers for under the microscope. And some of them will even have them in the oculars, the, the ones that you look through and you can um, measure. It's kind of cool. So this is two bacteria probably that just divided. They're still kind of connected to each other. And you can see these really fine structures that we don't normally see with a light microscope because they're so tiny. So you can see this long flagella here and then these little tiny projections that we'll talk about later called fimbri. And this one is a special technique called etching where they've etched away the different layers of this bacteria so you can see the contents of the cytoplasm, the plasma membrane, so you see they have that different layers, the outer membrane, and even an S layer um, shown here. So contrast is important, especially for light microscopes. Most of the bacteria that we work with and some other organisms um, are pretty much the same. They're translucent. They're, you know, they, you can see right through them. They're like ghosts. <laughs> um, so in order to actually be able to visualize them, especially using a light microscope, typically how we create contrast is we stain them, right? And then depending on which staining procedure you're doing, that can even tell you additional information other than just being able to, like you can see in these pictures, you can see the different shapes, right? And arrangements, how, how you know, there's a bunch of them lining up here. And, ones staying together and ones that are kind of curvy. And there's two different colors here, right? There's purple and pink because um, there's two different types of organisms on this slide. There are gram positive and gram negative. And they stain these different colors because of the two different dyes that we use, crystal violet and safranin, which is a reddish dye. This is probably the most common staining procedure done in a microbiology lab, right? Um, and that you guys will do in lab in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to talk about today in excessive detail this particular sp procedure. Another one um, that will give you different colors, um, so therefore they're called differential stains, is the acid fast. And this one's done specifically usually for mycobacteria. Uh, mycobacteria have a special cell wall that allows them to adhere to the carbofusion dye, which is this reddish purple dye um, that we utilize in the lab. And then usually we have some other contrasting color. The most common is kind of a bluish color. So the organisms in the center all clumped up here are probably mycobacteria, what we call acid fast or acid fast positive. And these little dots that you're seeing off on the periphery, these are the non-acid fast, non-mycobacteria or <coughs> acid fast negative. This is another stain that we employ in the lab called endospore staining. And depending on which procedure you do, the different... Um, structures are going to be different colors. So in this case, the procedure they use, the endospores, which are outside the cells right now, because the cells have deteriorated, are kind of a pinkish color, where the cells themselves, before they turned into endospores, are kind of this bluish color. I have no idea, because I didn't say what method this is. I've never really seen this one deployed. Um, we use a different method in the lab. We make the endospores green. We use the Schaefer-Fulton method. And the cells are kind of reddish um, pink yeah. because we use malachite green, which is a green dye, and we use safranin, which is a red dye in the procedure. 
So these we're getting different colors because we're using more than one dye, right? Sometimes we'll do a simple stain where we just use one dye. So we're just staining the cells themselves. So notice the bluish cells here, and or <coughs> this is supposed to be purple. It does not look purple to me. It looks blue. Uh, <laughs> and these are blue, right? These are supposed to be blue. And just the, you just see one color, right? Because there's only one organism, and you only used one dye. So you're only seeing one shape. You're only seeing one color. This is a, also a single dye, but in this case, the background is stained and not the cells. So the cells are clear. These are actually the bacteria cells, these little rod-shaped guys. This other stuff is literally probably dirt on the slide. Little specks of dirt. So that can be difficult for people sometimes too, right? Is what am I actually supposed to be seeing, right? What do bacteria look like? So getting yourself oriented. So mainly we're going to create contrast by staining. Some microscopes, though, can uh, use special filters and the speed of light and kind of change that with the different filters and create contrast that way. So what you see here are three euglena, right, all the same specimen, using three different types of light microscopes. This top one right here where the background is quite bright, this is what's called bright field microscopy. This is what we do in the lab, like your standard light microscope in the lab, most labs that you go into, this is what you're doing is bright field microscopy. Because of that, the organisms themselves usually need to have some type of color or you need to stain them. And they're going to absorb the light and that's going to allow you to visualize them where the background is going to be quite bright. So that's bright field microscopy. On contrast, on the other side, notice the background is dark here. That's dark field microscopy. And that's where the light is not shined up through the specimen, but from the side. So the specimen tends to be more illuminated. You see how it's kind of shining? And the background will be dark. The th hmm? Because the, the light is coming um, from the side instead of up <laughs> through the specimen. Oh, why would you do dark field as opposed to bright field? Um, some organisms that we work with, excellent question, by the way. So he asked, and I should repeat it, he asked, why would you do dark field as opposed to bright field microscopy? And I can give you a real world example. So the organism that causes syphilis uh, is a spirochete, and it does not stain well with most stains that uh, we use in the lab. And so and if you wanted to actually be able to visualize that one, typically we use dark field microscopy or other types of microscopy that help you visualize it without having to stain it. So one of those would be the next one, which is the one in the center here, known as phase contrast. So this uses special filters. So you can use a standard light microscope. You just need additional filters for this one. And by knocking the wavelengths of light out of phase with each other, it helps um, accentuate the subtle differences in how the light is passing through the different organisms. So all of a sudden, when you look at this picture, right, you're not just seeing the euglena, are you? Are you noticing there's other stuff that's much smaller that you really did not notice, especially in bright and maybe a little bit in dark field microscopy? So there are actually other organisms on this slide or this specimen that you were, they were too tiny, right? They weren't stained, and so you weren't really visualizing them. By using phase contrast, it helped create that little bit of contrast that you needed to be able to see them. One of the added benefits to especially phase contrast or dark field as opposed to bright field where you're staining most of your specimens is guess what staining does to your organism? It kills it. It's toxic. <laughs> right? Sometimes it goes in, sometimes it just coats the outside, but pretty much you're going to kill it. I always have flashbacks to college when the fraternity decided to paint the swan at the pond pink, like a flamingo. Guess what happened to that poor swan? It died. The paint they used was toxic. Killed it. So think about that too as Mardi Gras is approaching and we have this need to decorate our animals. 
make sure you're using approved stuff and don't kill them. And by the way, swans mate for life. The one that's left, I can't remember if it's male or female, not happy. Really grouchy animal. And you kind of can't blame him, or her, right? No. We did a bad thing. So contrast, right? If we stain them, we kill them. And if you were looking at somebody like this Euglena, who usually swims around, if you stain them, what is he not doing anymore? <laughs> He's not swimming around, right? So if you wanted to see something like motility, you can't stain them, right? Because you're going to kill them. And unless we're talking about zombie bacteria, which I haven't seen just yet, or zombie protozoa, <laughs> Or Protus, in this case, uh, yeah, they're not going to move when they're dead. Can you see those videos of YouTube with like the Protus in the background? Mm-hmm. Most of the really good ones are phase contrast. Yeah, or um, the organism has enough contrast that you can see it under light microscopy, but a lot of times it'll decrease the light too to create more contrast in order to have a better image. But the really good ones are usually dark field or phase contrast. I've seen some really amazing ones too. With the detail, you could see the, the cilia moving and yeah, they're really pretty ones. So much cool stuff out there. But yeah, those are, those are expensive microscopes. And very good microscopists, very good scientists utilizing <laughs> that microscope. Oh, it's got mad skills. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually gotten some pretty decent ones in the microbiology lab, too, which I totally forgot to get some amoeba for a lab today. Darn it. I got distracted. I'll have to try and save some for next week. So another thing we talk about, and most of us have experienced nowadays, too, especially with our phones, although it's a little bit different with our phones because it's about data, right? When we're taking digital images with our phones, which is like everyone does now, <laughs> um, if you go to blow up that image, right, it gets what? Blurry. And that has to do with how much information you have, right? Do you have enough in the smaller format that when you blow it up, you don't lose resolution? A little bit different with light microscopy, right? We're talking about how good that lens is at focusing the light so you can see and discern an image. So the other problem, Dan, do you need those to see me? No? Yeah. Yeah. To see that? You can take them off for a second. How many fingers am I holding up? Two. Two. You can see? Yeah. It's not blurry for you? I mean, okay. blurry, but, but, but size, yeah. and this is, this is important, right? So I'm holding two fingers up very close together. You can put your glasses back on if you want. The reason why he knows it's two is not because he's clearly seeing it, because he's calculating with his brain how wide my fingers might be. Right? If I'd done three, maybe he would have picked two. I was trying to decide which way I should go today. Right? Um, but you do so much more with, with your brain for your vision than you realize, too. Right? You do these types of calculations based on your experience as well. Um, no brain with a, with a microscope, right? It can't calculate these types of things. Um, it's really reliant on its abilities that are built in. And that's those lenses that are fixed, just like your lenses are fixed for your, for your contacts or for your um, glasses. And that's called the prescription, right? So that's an actual number. So when they're making the lens, they make it to the correct specifications to correct for what your lenses, your natural lenses and your eyes cannot do, right? And so most of us, the shape of the lens, we're able to change it enough that you can see far and close. And then as you get older, right, you get, your eyes get tired of doing that, I guess you could say, and it gets harder and harder to be able to see, especially close up, usually. And so then you're stuck with reading glasses, or like I do, I just have two computer screens and I blow everything up. <laughs> I guess I can't keep track of those glasses. I don't really read anything in text anymore, I read everything on screens, which they worry about now too, right, what effect that is having on our eyes. Um, in children's eyes as they're developing. So resolving power or limit resolution is actually a number that can be calculated. In lab we do that, in lecture we just talk about it. 
So that'll actually give you, based on those lenses and their ability and what wavelength of light you're using, with a formula, it'll tell you how far apart two objects would have to be for you to discern them as two separate objects. So just like my fingers being close together made it difficult, but if I had spread them apart, it would make it much easier to discern them as two separate. So the question is, how close can I get before you no longer can resolve them as separate? Make sense? I think you have three different kind of lenses in the light microscope. I think it's 40x, mm -hmm. 10x, and 100x. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. So, um, that's my next slide. So, there's several different what we call objective lenses. So the oculars, what you look through, right, those are usually fixed at around 10x. So 10 times magnified with just that one lens. But most of the mic light microscopes we use are called compound microscopes. They take into combination the objectives, which are the ones you can change between the different magnifications and the oculars, which are fixed. So each one of them is usually on a revolving nose piece, right, this ridge that you should use to turn. Don't grab these guys because they're actually screwed into this and they will fall out and break. Um, if you keep pulling on them. And actually this one you see it has a ridge on it. That's for taking it off the microscope <laughs> because sometimes you have to do like I do. It's easier to take it off to clean it really well when people do not clean up after themselves. That one's called the high dry. It's not supposed to have any oil on it. Unlike the one behind it, which is not shown in this picture, that says oil on it, that's the one where you use oil. And when you're done, you wipe it off because if you don't, these will actually creep into and behind the lens and then you can't clean it. You throw it out and you buy another one. And these are the ones that are a couple hundred dollars a piece on a microscope. So other than the microscope itself, these are the most pricey thing um, that you buy. Unlike glasses nowadays, the frames seem to be more expensive than the lenses, <laughs> it seems. I know, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, this is the expensive part. And so these are fixed. So they'll have stamped on them their magnification. So in this case, this one is a 20x. This one's rare. Most labs that we work in here have a 10x, which is what we call low power, because 10 times 10 is only 100 times magnified. A lot of them have the scanning. It has a little red ring on it. It's only four times magnified. In microbiology lab, that one's just pretty much a waste of time. It just creates nice big space so you can take your slides on and off your stage and not hit the lenses. Right? Typically, we start focusing here at low, and then we may or may not go to uh, high dry, and then we usually go right to oil, right, because that's going to be a highest magnification. So here we're going 100 times, right, 200 times, 400 times, and the oil immersion is usually 100 times 10, so a 1,000 times total magnification. That seems like a lot, right? <laughs> Wait till you start looking at bacteria, like, oh, I wish it could be bigger. <laughs> uh, nope. But then, how, how can we see these as separate things, and, and how is it that we can see bacteria <coughs> as separate? It has to do with the numerical aperture of these lenses, and that is the second number. So after the slash, the decimal number, so here 0.4, for this one 0.7, for, for this one I think it's 85, 0.85. That number is the numerical aperture. The other lens in the microscope that helps focus light onto the specimen is in the stage. Anyone know what the name of that lens is? It's the condenser, right? That one also has, it's a lens, right? So does it have a numerical aperture? Is it one that factors into resolution? Yeah, because guess what it does? It focuses light. So it focuses light onto the specimen. These capture light to help generate the image, your objective lenses. So it is those two numerical aptitures added together, divide with the, um, with the wavelength of light being the top of your equation. And if you look at any of the microscopes we have in the lab, although the image doesn't look blue, if you look below, there's usually a blue filter. That's going to give you the smallest wavelength of light and the best, clearest image. But the image is not going to appear blue, right? We're filtering the blue light. So the other problem we deal with with light is the refraction of that light. So this pencil looks broken, doesn't it? Is it? No, it's kind of an optical illusion. It has to do with the speed of light as it travels through different two different media. In this case, water 
in glass as opposed to air in glass. It moves at different speeds and it's scattered differently through those two different media. So this comes into the problem too. If you want to go spear fishing, you're better off getting in the water because you're in the water with the fish and so therefore you're seeing right it through the same media. You're both in the water. If you're trying to nail a fish from out of the water, you're dealing with refraction of light. So you think he's here, right? But he is actually down here, right? Because that image, just like this one, is distorted because of the speed of light through water versus air. So that creates a problem for our microscopes, right? Because we're using light. It's passing through air and glass slides. <coughs> so here's your glass slide with maybe even a cover slip on it. If there's just air in between the ocular lens, then light can be scattered and not as much as you need to see a nice clear image enters into that objective lens. What we add is called immersion oil. It immerses the lens and the slide right in oil. This helps focus that light in because the light is going to come and basically be traveling the same speed as it was through the glass. So this oil has a similar refractive index speed right, of that light through that substance as glass, except it's not glass, right? It's malleable. And so it can move so that we can adjust. So all the time in microbiology lab, students are like, Miss Eric, I can't see anything. I'm like, yep, I know it. You know why I know this? Because I can see the gap between the slide and the oil objective lens. If there is a gap, you're not in focus. You're not anywhere near in focus. If, right, it's almost touching the slide and the oil is filling the gap and you actually see the light like get bright, then there's a possibility you're going to get there. Right? The other way, not going to happen. Not for what you're supposed to be seeing anyways, right? You may be looking at dust or something else, right? But you're not seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. Make sense? <laughs> so... Some microscopes, without even staining, right? This amoeba looks like he's going to attack you, right? Like the blob, right? This is difference, differential inference contrast microscopy. And so this is, you know, again, using contrast. Uh, so much so that it even appears um, three-dimensional, the image that they took from this microscope. So you can see how it's kind of coming out at you, and you can see the back. These guys are pretty, these are pretty cool microscopes. Still a light microscope. Still light microscopes, but employing uh, additional technique of fluorescence. So some organisms are naturally fluorescent. Others you can add fluorescent dyes to, right, or fluorescent labeled antibodies to stain with. So there's lots of cool stuff that you can do. Uh, when you're using fluorescent, you're using ultraviolet light. We cannot see ultraviolet light, and ultraviolet light is actually damaging to you. So these microscopes have to have special filters, and you're, the fluorescence are the result of electrons being excited by the ultraviolet light. So the ultraviolet light is shined on them, right? It excites electrons depending on the pigments that they're entering and acting with, they'll produce different fluorescent colors. So they'll like glow. So in this case, they actually used antibodies with particular fluorescent labels to them to be able to identify Streptococcus pyogens, which is the causative agent of strep throat. Uh, similar to the rapid strep test, right? And in that case, Right, again, they're getting a result based on antibodies recognizing that bacteria. In this case, it's helping them visualize it um, in this picture. 
Others can help you tell when you stained if the cells were alive or dead. So in this one, like the ones that were alive when they started were green and the dead ones are red. doesn't say what B is. What messed up is that? I just noticed that. Uh, all right, so this is, what do you think, based on the image? It's black and white, isn't it? So is this a light microscope? No. no. This is an electron microscope. And this is a different type of electron microscope. This is scanning electron microscope. So commonly abbreviated, and you'll see this abbreviation in your book, SEM. And this is where it can scan the surface. This actually uses gold to coat. Right? It's a very expensive procedure. Um, but you can see them, you know, more of a three-dimensional type image. Uh, in preparing <laughs> these organisms for electron microscopy, trust me, um, they're not alive anymore. You don't see stuff move. It can't move with electrons, right? We can't get an image if it's always moving, <laughs> right? So it's fixed, it's dead, right? It's not going to be alive again. And it has to be prepared in a, in a special way. So this is the um, one that has its own special room at LSU. Uh, this is the scanning, uh, the laser scanning microscope, right? Where again, it's, it's using lasers. And so we can create multiple different images on the computer screen um, and you can even use special dyes to be able to see um, different parts. This is an example of that scan tunneling microscope. And so you can see, again, the color is generated by the computer. But you can see the double helix, right, of DNA. There's actually three turns here. One, two, three. Of that molecule. Here's some um, pores, right? So down to, you know, groups of proteins in the membrane, creating pores in a cell. Pretty amazing stuff. So um, how do we identify and, and stain, and, and why would we want to stain? We want to be able to see stuff, right? Other than just the organism, sometimes we want to even visualize special structures. So with the simple stain straight up, we just want to see the organism, right? We're using one dye, whether we're staining the background or the cells, we want to see those uh, organisms. For acid fast, endospore, gram staining, we're wanting to go one step further. We're actually going to learn some information about these um, organisms. For capsule and flagella stain, the names themselves of these stains tell you what we're looking for. We're looking for these spe special structures. We're looking for a capsule, if it has it. We're looking for a flagella. And in order to visualize these special structures, you have to do special staining techniques in order to see them, especially using a light microscope. So what do we mean by a simple stain? Just a single dye. That's it. Simple is one dye. Why do we stain cells? Yeah, so we can see them. So we can create contrast so that we can see them. There's two chemically different types of dyes that we employ. We use basic dyes or acidic dyes. These dyes have a charge to them. Right? Basic dyes have a positive charge Acidic dyes have a negative. negative charge. So notice that these crystal violet and methylene blue are staining the cells, right? These are, <coughs> these are basic dyes. They're positively charged. What do we know about charges? What's attracted to what? So if it's positive, the dye opposites, right? Explains my first marriage. Okay, so opposites attract, right? <laughs> Got you to laugh. Oh, yeah, many years. Okay, so cell must be what? If the dye is positive, the cell must be negative. negative. Oh, wow, that was awesome. Okay, so negative, 
Anyone know what inside that cell has a very negative charge to it? What type of molecules? Proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, sugars. Anyone know? Protein can be negatively charged. Water is kind of polar, yeah. DNA. DNA is very highly negatively charged. And um, the phospholipids, those phosphates associated with the lipids that make up membranes, highly negatively charged. Phospholipids, yeah. So the positive dyes, which are the ones we use the most, the basic dyes, actually will go into the cell. And especially for eukaryotes, it's attracted to what? Which is where all the DNA is. The nucleus. That's why the nucleus is stained so well, right? Because there's a whole lot of negative stuff in there, right? And you're probably using a basic dye. So they're attracted. They go in. They stain the cell. They'll stain the membrane. And so we can visualize them. Acidic dyes, on the other hand, have a negative charge, and the cell is negative. So we've got a problem here where we're doing what instead? We're not attracting. We're, we're repelling. Right? So that's what's happening in this picture here with the dark background. That's an acidic dye known as nigrazine, and it's being repelled by those negatively charged cells. And anything else negatively charged on that slide, unfortunately. <coughs> so it's like when you try to put two magnets together the wrong way. It's because you get the two like poles, right? And they just keep psh, flying apart, right? You just got to flip them over, and then they'll stick. Make sense? So what are we seeing? We just seen like shape, huh? And like how many of there are, and that can be beneficial, right? If that's all you want to know. But usually we want to go one step further. We want to know something more about them. And I think that's probably where we'll stop today. So what should we do before class next time? Read, watch animations, right? Look at those things I have online. Um, definitely bring the next lecture, right? Because we'll finish this one and go on to the next. Thank you. You're welcome. Ooh, I've got to plug this baby in, too.